Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Smith, and I'm going to talk about reactive machine learning and functional programming today. Um, so before I get into like what is my topic, because it's kind of dense, I'll start uh, with a little self-introduction. Who am I? Uh, I am a guy who's all into uh, big data, functional programming, uh, machine learning, and startups. And so uh, I, I do that during my work hours, and I do that uh, outside of work. And, and I'm going to bring together all of my passions in this talk on the act of machine learning and functional programming. So to introduce what those kind of dense concepts are, reactive machine learning, functional programming, I'm going to start with a sort of example problem. And this is, a, this is a real problem that I have, and I'll propose how I'm going to solve it. And so my problem is, I am the owner of the world's cutest French bulldog. Now, I know this. This is generally well known in the New York City area where I live and work. Uh, but the world doesn't know this. And so I want to solve this problem by making my French bulldog into an Instagram celebrity. I want her to be the Kim Kardashian of French bulldogs. And so to do that, I need to understand, how do you take really great pictures of French bulldogs? I mean, like, what, like if they just look cute, they're in a cute outfit, is that enough? Do we need like, more props? Do we actually even need to go on location? Uh, I don't know, because I don't know enough about Instagram, but I think this is a common problem. So I'm proposing that we solve this problem using machine learning. Uh, and so I think machine learning is a great solution to this. It's one of my favorite tools to solve problems. Uh, and so I'm going to try and predict uh, how many likes or shares I can get on Instagram uh, based on the features of the picture. And so I'm going to build up a full machine learning system. And so this is going to be our organizational device for this talk. These are the five phases that I've conceived of it of a machine learning system. And so we're going to go around this little diagram. We're going to talk about each component in turn and how we can build up our system uh, to be able to predict uh, exactly how we can get ourselves to amazing levels of celebrity uh, for my dog, Nom Nom. Uh, but we're not going to do it in, any pr in, a, in an unprincipled manner. Uh, I think one of the key components of what I want to talk about today is a reactive approach to machine learning. And so what are reactive systems? So in this talk, the definitions I'm going to use for reactive come out of the, basically the, the exact materials in the reactive manifesto, which some of you may have read. Uh, and, and certainly it's been referenced in, in Victor's talk last night. And so briefly, what, what are reactive systems? So reactive systems have four traits or four principles, and they interact with each other. And so I'll go through them in turn. So first is that reactive systems are responsive. And so what we mean by responsive is that these systems respond to user input in a consistent, time-bounded manner. Right? The second principle is that reactive systems are resilient, which means that they respond to failure. They get back up when they're knocked down. Um, the, the third principle is that they're elastic which means that uh, they, they maintain consistent responsiveness in the face of varying load. And finally, they're message-driven, uh, which means that they are going to communicate via a message-passing pattern, right? That they're not going to be in the same process directly connected. Um, so I think it's important to keep in your mind that these things interact with each other, and they support each other. And that this is a sort of design paradigm. It's a, this is not an arbitrary choice of, of four principles that you, you might want in your system. Uh, similarly, there's a, there's a set of connected strategies in reactive systems uh, that, that, are often, uh, that are often used, uh, and they're shown here, and I'll break them down in turn. Uh, first is replication. So replication means having the same uh, process running in two different locations independently. I would also say that it may also apply to having uh, data at rest as well as data in motion, you know, uh, so similarly like a distributed file system. Uh, the next strategy is isolation or containment. Uh, this is about not having your errors be able to propagate out of a bounded known scope. And the third strategy is supervision or delegation. So these are hierarchical control patterns, right? So these are the strategies we're going to see come up again and again as we, as we try to implement our machine learning system in a reactive manner. All right. So What's our system? What's our, what are we building up here? Well, we're building up a system that's, that's not going to be just for me, right? So this, is, this is, needs to be an extremely scalable, predictive system for understanding how you can get your dog's pictures liked on Instagram, right? So this is, I'm actually going to scale this all the way up to a startup. I'm going to get it seed funding. It's going to be called Cana Stella. Our slogan will be, we will make your dog into a star. So let's start with that ambitious goal in our mind and think about how we can build the best system possible from the ground up using reactive techniques. So we start, at this point in, the, in, our, in our reactive machine learning system, with a component of the system that most people don't usually think of as a machine learning task, and that is data collection. So in this context, what we're doing is we're acquiring data from the outside world. We're getting, say, uh, views and likes off of the Instagram API, uh, and, we're, and we're trying to capture those into our system in a particular way. 
Uh, and so how I'm going to propose that we do this is using an immutable data architecture. Um, and so in particular, uh, this is an approach here where I'm going to walk you through. So we, we, uh, we acquire new page events uh, from actions. Uh, and then we write them into our event store. So in our event store, in this case, is, is a little bit idealized, uh, but should be, could, be any, could be anything from, say, a distributed database like Mongo or Cassandra, or could, in fact, be a, 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 something more like Kafka, where we have a sort of distributed commit log. So when we write this to the database, we're actually writing it using futures, right? And so the important concept here is uh, when we write using futures uh, like this in this reactive manner, uh, we get certain principles to hold place, right? So for one thing, uh, this is a very responsive approach because we're completely non-blocking, right? We're not, we're not waiting for this remote communication to occur and continue to tie up a thread. And the other part here is, of course, is that we're very elastic then, um, in, that we, uh, in, in that because we're using our resources so efficiently, we're able to scale up uh, much, much simpler. And I would point out that uh, in, in many reactive uh, implementations of how to write out to persistence, in fact, under the covers, you're using an actor system. Uh, in this case, uh, this actually happens to be using Akka underneath. All right. So next is we move on. So we've collected our data. So we've ingested into our system. So we have this sort of, uh, we have a, a record of facts from the outside world. Uh, but we haven't yet made them useful, right? So we, we, we need to turn them into, uh, we need to turn them into actionable knowledge. And so the machine learning terminology for this is features, uh, features and concepts usually. So these are, these are the transformations of our raw data, those, those representations of this event occurred, that event occurred, about uh, likes on, on pictures of dogs on Instagram. So what does that look like? Well, here I'm using, uh, again, another Scala implementation. Uh, this time we're in Spark. Uh, so I think most people are probably familiar with Spark. Spark, folks, yep, okay, great. Um, just discussed in the last talk, so if you're in that one, uh, good preparation for this one and understanding how Spark is conceived. So in this case, uh, what are we doing in feature extraction? So here's a, I'm gonna show you some basic code where we go from raw event views and build them up into data sets. In particular, the abstraction in, in Spark is called an RDD, for Resilient Distributed Data Set. So you can see that we're using functional idioms here, we're mapping, we're using uh, anonymous functions and then that we join them together, and then I'm gonna show you how these are actually composed, right? So in this composition here, we're taking all of these pipeline steps. These can be very large, you know, multi-hour operations occurring on very large clusters, uh, and then we join them together. But so you see one interesting thing here is that we, we have this sort of composition that we can see, and it follows it through. We've maintained complete type safety. Um, but then the actual execution of this is managed entirely by Spark's query planning, in that it's, uh, it understands the directed acyclic graph of computation. And I think this is an important point, right? This is the power of the lazy execution here. We haven't actually uh, executed these things at the time that we've, uh, we've composed them, right? So there is a delay of execution here. Um, and, and I think the, uh, this talk's not gonna go super deeply into Spark, and I just wanna call out that, um, you know, unlike some of the other techniques I'm gonna describe here, Spark is a huge, sophisticated system that has absolutely every single reactive uh, uh, principle and strategy in use that you could imagine. Uh, you know, it, it is entirely a, a message-driven system that is highly scalable both down and up. Um, so an, an important uh, principle that I think a lot of people have picked up in, in using, in developing functional code in Spark is that it's actually perfectly replicable whether you're developing it on your local laptop and then scaling out to a massive cluster. Um, but uh, there's, uh, there's a resilience through uh, optimistic execution. Um, there's all sorts of strategy being employed here. There is, there's replication in that we're running these things uh, frequently in parallel, uh, that, that, uh, that nodes failures cannot leak out due to message passing semantics. Uh, there's supervisory things going on as well in terms of ensuring that this is going to complete. Uh, so Spark is, is very capable, and so we, we saw a big advantage to, have, to separating out that sort of composition from its execution, uh, from being able to understand exactly how our dependencies are being parsed. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about a library that I helped a uh, colleague of mine create. Uh, and this is, a, this is our take on how to further evolve uh, Spark pipelines and just in general pipeline composition and Scala in general using more functional idioms. Uh, so it's already a very reactive system, but there's yet more you can do. And so this is the same pipeline we saw before. So we were, we're taking raw likes and views and we're transforming them in various ways, uh, but we're passing them through a pipe function. And so what this pipe function does is each of these vowels is returning a, an object which itself contains a function. So now we've, we've more completely separated out uh, the, 
composition of these things from the execution of them. So this is not strictly necessary in Spark because Spark already does this for you, but what this provides to you is that each of these individual vowels is now separately testable, which creates uh, great ways of achieving trust in your, in your composition and allows for simpler dependency injection. And were you outside of an, of an awesome execution environment that gives you all sorts of query planning uh, in, in just regular Scala, this would give you the same sorts of facilities around concurrency uh, and, and, and understanding what to parallelize without any, uh, without any actual imperative orchestration of do this, do, then do that, simply defining your graph through composition. All right. Next, we're on to model learning. So this is the part that I think a lot of people conceive of as, oh, this is, the, this is what we actually do in machine learning. We, we fit models to data. But it, it actually took us a lot to get to this point. Uh, but as we've proceeded down this path, we've used nothing but uh, immutable data structures. We've, we've, we've used functional transformations the whole path. So what do we have now? Well, in our last path step, we took, we took uh, events about likes and views about the dog, and then we transform them into usable features. So now we have sort of uh, semantically meaningful representations of raw data. So we can feed those to a model learning algorithm. And so Mark's talk was a great talk about, uh, about how to implement uh, 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 machine learning algorithms. It, it, it talks a great deal about um, how you can understand, how you can build one, for example, from the ground up. In this case, uh, we are going to rely on a Spark implementation again. Uh, but we, we, we want to zoom out a little bit from just what is it doing, but like how is it actually going to behave? Because remember at the top of our graph, we're concerned with responsiveness, right? So responsiveness in a machine learning pipeline is a tricky thing for a job that might run many, many hours over many, many nodes. So the first thing is, again, we're going to need to lean on futures. Um, and so we're going to train our model, but we're going to wrap it in a future. And then we're also going to define a default model. So a default model is something that uh, I haven't seen discussed a lot, but is actually really necessary. And so a default model is, is, is some safe state to fall back to, right? So it is itself still a model. It still, it still is a mapping from features to predictions. Uh, but it doesn't require you to train a new model. It, it's some sort of known default. And so this can be based on uh, domain knowledge, past data, or it can just simply be something as simple as a, uh, as a default class label. Uh, so the way that this is now defined is we're going to wrap both of those, uh, the, the learn model and the future model, uh, in a first completed of so that we can get a timeout sort of functionality. Now, this is really important, right, for maintaining that responsiveness I was talking about. And again, this is, a, this is really quite key to our elasticity. So if we've undersized our cluster, our run times are going to go up on models. And so do we just never return a model? Uh, well, I, I would propose that returning a default model is often exactly what you need to do in many systems like this, so that you want to at least respond back, that you're not going to just uh, you're not going to violate the responsiveness contract by massively increasing your response time under ex excessive load. All right. So where are we? We've got a model. Are we done? <laughs> We're not done. We're, there's, still, there's still work to do. So, so once we have that model, what do we do with it? I mean, wh what is a model? I've kind of described, you know, we got something back out of the end of this model learning pipeline. We, we implemented this scalable, uh, we implemented or imported this, like, scalable machine learning algorithm that executed on this massive cluster, uh, but how do we put it to use, right? So, so a model is of no use if it's just sitting in memory somewhere. We need to be able to apply it, and that's what we're going to do here, is that we're going to publish our model, and our model is going to be uh, specific to our French Bulldog data set, but we need, to, we need to get it out there in the wild somehow. We need to make it available to traffic. So here's an example implementation here, uh, and, and this implementation uh, relies, again, on a on an, on an ACA actor system behind the scenes. Uh, but it's a, it's a fairly straightforward uh, functional uh, idiom here, right? So that ultimately our model is, is, is just a, a pure function. That's, that's all it is, right? So it's simply a map from features to predictions. And so this, this makes it quite simple uh, to publish such a thing. And so, so the strategy I'm going to show in more detail as we get deeper into this is that the way to publish this is as a pure function as a service, right? So that the model itself is a pure function, but the actual publishing of such a thing and exposing it to the world is going to involve more complexity. So we want to make sure to keep our model nice and stateless, which gives us nice properties so that we can do things like uh, it, replicate it, right? So that if it's a pure function, it doesn't matter how many copies we have of it out there. Uh, there's going to be no side effects as a result of that, right? The other thing is that it's going to make it easier to contain something like this. Um, because there's so very little here, this is going to work nicely within a modern microservices pattern. 
Uh, and the last thing I want to call out is this implementation actually is a fully message-driven one in that uh, this, is not necess this, is, uh, this is going to communicate actually returning just pure JSON. So this is just going to return back a message of a prediction, allowing uh, a further hierarchical concept to know what to do with that message and where to pass it. And I'll show, I'll show you how that fits into the bigger uh, architecture in just a little bit. And the last thing to call it again is, is again, we're, uh, there's, a piece of, there's actually two pieces to model publishing here, right? So we, we had our pure function that we're going to wrap in a service. Uh, but the other thing is that we need to let the, the system as a whole know that this has happened. And again, we can, we can reference out the same sort of event sourcing model, right? So that we, we, we publish out an event that such a thing has happened. We have made, uh, you know, we, we have our immutable event store. We've just simply made that information available. And we can, we can again, make those writes using a reactive programming pat pattern, using futures, uh, being non-blockable, which gives us uh, a great way of communicating out that we've published a model, but we have not mutated an existing model, right? So that we've, we've only provided the, a new one available as a service, and that we've, we've let that, we've, we've uh, published the event that that has happened. And so I'll show you, that's all going to come together here real quick in the next section. Because we are still not done. We still haven't actually used our model to make a prediction in the real world. Right? So we've gone through this whole process of, of acquiring our raw data and processing it, and then sending it through to, to learn a model, and then, and then publishing that model out. But then now we need to serve it, right? So that we now, as, as, our, you know, as we're hacking away at our Canis Stella startup, doing all of our great functional programming, we need to be able to uh, provide some sort of application uh, which will allow us to take in requests for predictions and return out those actual predictions. So that it needs to be able to do that in a, in a way that is, that is very reactive. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through a, a kind of an architecture diagram here. There's, there is code backing this, but I, uh, I, think, I think it's gonna be clear if we kind of talk about the top pieces. So, um, all right, where are we? Okay, so traffic comes into our system. Okay, so there's a core model supervisory concept here, right? And so the model supervisor is going to sit on top of everything. Um, Apologize, and there's a lot of delays as I try to advance the slides. So, as traffic comes into our system, uh, we need to route it out to those model services, those those encapsulated forms of pure functions, right? So, because uh, these are going to be containerized small microservices, which expose our, our function to traffic. Now, but we also need to route that the route those requests to multiple models, right? So this is one of the key tasks that we do within machine learning, uh, operating it in the wild. In fact, what we do is we we run multiple models in parallel. Uh, this, this, is this is necessary for things like online prediction because uh, we predict, we evaluate performance of machine learning models empirically. Uh, we, we see what they do when exposed to real data. And so obviously this is a good example of a supervisory pattern, right? So we, uh, the models themselves do not know the total level of traffic. They're simply getting messages sent to them uh, that to, to return back a prediction. So another key part of what, what this sort of approach uh, enables is that there's actually not just different types of models, right, but there are different points in time, right? So a model it, you can view as a sort of a result of a derived transformation of the data at a single point in time. This is that sort of log-based structure, right? This is, this is a pure uh, immutable view of, view of the world. And so as you see here with our French Bulldog Model 1 and our French Bulldog Model 2, these are different points in time. We retrained our model. We're doing this all the time. That's what our infrastructure exists to do. Uh, so these are, this, is a, this is an excellent use of time travel, right? Because we, we did not mutate the existing model service, right? We didn't bring it down and then like load our jar onto the server. We brought up a new service and we published an event and that event said, hey, you have a new option. You have a new model that you can route out to for French Bulldogs if you want to. And so this becomes even more important as we operate our modeling services. So we're going to communicate via message passing, obviously. And so in this case, our model may go rogue, right? So our, our model may have just been published and it may have never been good at all. Maybe there was some fault in the upstream system and we're going to detect that using, uh, using message passing. And so, so in particular, model monitoring would be my suggestion here, is that we're going to see how it performs. And th in this case, this, this, this model has gone rogue. It, it's, now, it's now gone to a degenerate state in which it calls says that no one likes any dogs, no one's gonna like anything, no one's gonna click on anything. We know this is a known uh, pathology, right? This can't possibly be true within our system. And so the supervisory uh, model here, so the model supervisor rather, uh, can, see this, uh, can receive these messages and simply sever that link and just no longer pa pass traffic there. And so obviously uh, this gives us nice properties uh, from an architectural perspective 
um, because, of course, we have contained that failure. Um, Right, so we've contained, we've contained that failure. This, this, is, this service uh, no longer receives traffic and can be, and can be safely killed, right? Uh, in no sense did it propagate to any other models, right? Uh, similarly, this gives us enormous resilience, right? Because this is a sort of failure in our system, right? So it, this, that bad French bulldog model never, ma never was throwing exceptions. It did not fail as software. It failed as a machine learning model. Uh, but we still have resilience, right, in that we are, have, have a mechanism to encode uh, what is supervision, right? What, what, is, what, is, what is the actual responsible component uh, for understanding what is the operation of a successful model? So we're resilient. And then the last thing, of course, is that remember we had a, a, a message passing semantic here. And so I don't, I don't want to get too deep into like how you would implement such a thing, but basic monitoring is actually sufficient enough, right? So that this can work with another existing technologies that you're already using to monitor for things like, oh, CPU is too high, or we've run out of disk space, or something like that. Uh, by incorporating in it in the semantics of machine learning into your modeling process, you're able to use that supervisory pattern and be able to to keep that uh, failure tightly contained and not have it contaminate the rest of your system. Uh, and so. I want to talk about, real briefly, so there's a, so some of you may be familiar with uh, immutable data architectures like the Lambda architecture, or Jay Krebs's the Caput architecture, and, and they're just, they're both, uh, they both agree to a large extent about how you should use an event sourcing model, right? That you, you have this immutable log of, of representations of data that you create. But as you saw within our machine learning architecture, we need, uh, we need to have uh, multiple models at the same time, right? And so we need to be able to travel within time as well. And so my little word for like that view of the world is it's a Greek chorus architecture because you need to be uh, referencing different actors at the same time, right? Like you need to hear them both at the same time. It's not simply, so in a sort of uh, kappa architecture or materialized view of maintenance, you're actually replacing your view of the world. But in this case, we, we, we are taking deeper advantage of the immutable underlying data architecture that we're relying upon in that we're using time travel to live at two different points in time at the same at the same time, right? So that we have today's model and yesterday's model both speaking now, and we're reasoning about them. Uh, if you spend any time studying uncertain data, this is, this, is, this is very similar to a possible world semantic. We're performing some sort of uncertain query upon a possible view of the world that may or may not be valid, and using our supervisory function um, to make decisions about when, when one of those views is wrong. So that's, that's my perspective on how reactive machine learning can be implemented using functional programming. I'm going to make the argument to you that as functional programmers, I think reactive machine learning and functional programming are better together. Uh, this is very similar to, to I think, the, the talk that Mark gave in that this is a great place to apply functional programming techniques. This, uh, building machine learning systems is actually incredibly hard. There are so many more components than people imagine. There's so, there's so many more difficult problems as you get down into the detail you might realize. Uh, the, and I think the thing is, to build them effectively, you need to build them in a principled manner. You need to understand, uh, in my opinion, the reactive paradigm is a great way to start with this. And as you get into the details of how you apply the reactive paradigm using the, using the reactive strategies, you see functional programming everywhere. It is the most natural way to do this. So we went from raw data to all the way to predictions being applied in the world. And, and we, saw, we saw consistent use of functional programming. And we never had to, to, to fall back on any sort of imperative technique at all. So, does this work? Well, I'm going to say, say yes, it does. I'm going to say the startup initially scaled up. We launched and, and, and just huge uptake of, of likes on Instagram from my dog. Really uh, caught the attention of the popular media. The fine art community absolutely loved her. And she was just, just, just adored by the, by the populace at large growing from New York and beyond. So that's my view of how you can and should employ reactive machine learning if you want to solve problems like this. You want to hear more about uh, reactive machine learning? Uh, I have a website up. It's mainly up there for uh, an email list. So I'm writing a book uh, for Manning on this topic specifically, and I would love to, to email you when the, the early access version goes on. You can follow me on Twitter, where I will probably be putting up more of this stuff. And then I have a whole bunch of other resources on the code that's in this talk that I will, uh, I will post in the slides that will go out uh, later this week. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time.
Right, so this example is, is, is shown in a sort of batch mode, but I think it's pretty clear that if you, if you uh, use this approach straight through, there's no reason in which it, you can't have streaming data flows and ultimately um, online learning, right? So that, uh, in particular, that uh, there's several Spark implementations that make this fairly straightforward if you're gonna publish a Spark model as your function within your, your model serving service um, uh, that, that, have, that allow you to go between batch and, batch and streaming modes. Batch and, and mini batch, right? You know, but uh, but still, yeah. That's that's. I think that's absolutely possible. Uh, I personally happen to have implemented all these things in batch mode for the for the time being, and I think that's that's quite common. Um, but I think that there's definitely great possibilities here uh, for people who do have more opportunity to have those things flow through, and I think it could could result in a really nice architecture. But I haven't done it yet. Thank you very much.